Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. A warm welcome to this third episode in the Fritillaria series on our podcast. Today I have Bob Wallace with me, who has been the chairman at the Fritillaria Group in the UK for eight years. Um, Bob is a biochemist by training, has worked in the pharmaceutical industry um, and in biotechnology, but he has a big passion together with his wife for botany and especially for the Fritillaria genus. Bob has traveled the world together with his wife in order to see Fritillaria in their native habitats and today he will take us on a journey basically from his garden in Wales to all kind of different places in the world where he has seen Fritillaria growing. And in addition to this podcast, Bob has also shared with me um, two short presentations. And these presentations are available as a video, both on our blog belonging to this um, episode. There's a blog post and I'm going to link to this in the show notes so that you can find it easily. And also on our YouTube channel, you can also find his presentations. And one of these presentations is dedicated to describing the subgenera of Fritillaria and this picture so that you can really see how these different plants look like. Um, and the other presentation is a visit to Anatolia that he has made with a group of other uh, Fritillaria enthusiasts. And there's both landscape pictures and pictures of the plants itself that they have seen by visiting a mountain and a mountain pass that they went on. So that's really interesting to see how these plants there are growing in the rocks in an alpine uh, native habitat. So I invite you to visit our blog or our YouTube channel to look at these short videos together with listening to, to what um, Bob has to share about all his travels. With that I say enjoy the interview and a very warm welcome to Bob Wallace. Thank you. Yeah I was wondering when and how your interest for the Fritillaria genus started if you can take us on your on your life's journey with Fritillaria there a little bit. The beginning of it is that my wife studied botany uh, in university and uh, on the notice board outside the lecture theater in her um, one of one of the years, I think probably her first year, um, was an advertisement for a talk by uh, a professor, Tom Hewer, who was a professor in the university. Uh, and he talked about his trip to Iran and Afghanistan. Um, and my wife thought, oh, that, what a wonderful Uh, lecture to go to. So she went that evening and we joined the Alpine Garden Society, or she joined the Alpine Garden Society, and was completely blown away by all the pictures of Alpines and Dionysias in particular, uh, etc. So um, we got into sort of alpine things, small plants. We only had a flat. Um, we only had a window box, so, so you can only grow small plants, you know. Um, And it kind of developed from there. And um, we uh, got a small garden and we started growing alpines. And then uh, we got a greenhouse and we started growing alpines and then decided that actually bulbs were somewhat simpler for what for our lifestyle. Uh, so we developed uh, slowly into more bulbous things. Um, that, and the reason for that is that we like to go away in the summer. Yeah, well, all of our holidays uh, are centered around plants. I mean, we don't go and sit on beaches. We like to go walking a lot. Um, so we're up, up in the mountains all over the, all over the world. 
um, looking at uh, bulbs in, uh, in, in their natural habitats. And somebody had to look after the plants while we were away. Um, so we thought, what's better than if you grow bulbs? They're, of course, dormant in the summer. So you, you, we can go away in the summer. They're dormant. They, they don't need looking after, which is which is which it worked work really well. And so we got kind of interest in bulbs, and we wanted to go and see bulbs in the wild, and they flower much earlier. So, so we were going away when they, when they needed to be looked after. So <laughs> there was a flaw in this logic. <laughs> <laughs> but but it worked out okay, <laughs> and um, we now uh, really specialise in bulbs, um, and um, specialise particularly in fritillaria. We sort of you know um, started to grow more and more fritillaries. I mean, we grow lots of other bulbs as well, and we grow lots of narcissus and crocus and colchicum and iris and uh, you know you name it. They're all uh, they're all uh, out there around in the garden or mainly in the greenhouses. We we grow most of them in pots. Uh, in a greenhouse plunged in sand. Uh, so they're in clay pots plunged in sand in uh, a mixture of um, a sort of loam, soil, uh, grit, and some humus. Um, and they're watered in the period when they need to grow and they're kept dryish uh, or drier during the period when they're, when they're dormant. And they, they start, most start to go dormant in the summer. Uh, they're starting to go dormant here now, which is what early May. Um, so uh, they will be kept much more, much drier. In fact, some of them completely dry until we uh, we will repot them in the summer. But we start to water again in sort of middle of September, usually, depending on the species and where it comes from, um, and when it would normally expect to come into growth. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we do. We've been. Uh, growing fritillarias for a very long time. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how you created your knowledge about fritillaria. So your wife is a botanist. You have a scientific background as well. But what did you do to learn about this uh, genus of plants? I mean, most of it, uh, uh, you know, in those days, of course, all had to come from books. But So we, we attended lectures. Uh, we went to a lot of uh, Alpine Garden Society flower shows. We have a huge number of friends. Uh, from uh, the, the, the flower shows uh, and the Alpine Garden Society. Um, we go to a lot of meetings. Um, um, we run a local group uh, here uh, specializing in alpines. Um, but we have a, you know, a big library. We, uh, you know, we, if, if a book gets published, we tend to buy it. Um, and of course, you know, all of this, this sort of started off long before the internet became available, long before email became available. Um, and now, I mean, you know, the electronic world has, has enabled us to, to share photographs, knowledge, uh, just much more freely than was ever possible before without, uh, you know, meeting people in person and going to visit them and stuff like that. But even then, we still really enjoy visiting people uh, in their gardens um, to have a look at how they're cultivating things. There are about 170, 180 species, depends on your opinion. Um, they are, there are a number of uh, subgenera within that, which have de de been defined on the morphological appearance. These plants are very specialized and they need special, uh, special conditions. Um, so, um, you know, e each one has its particular ecological niche. And we, we like to try and learn about that. And you learn about that by observing them in the wild. And we learn about that by uh, talking to people who are growing them. These plants come from very many different parts of the world. And you like to travel to see them. To how many places have you been? To <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have never thought to add it up. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they are only in the Northern Hemisphere. So you don't have to go south of south of the equator to, to see these in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been in uh, California. Uh, we've been in uh, all of the, well, most of the Mediterranean countries. So we've been in Morocco, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, uh, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, uh, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, most of these places we've been to more than once. Uh, unfortunately, in the last two years, because we've not been able to travel at all, but uh, mm. that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. Mm. 
How do you do if, I mean, you, you can visit these places. Do you know where to go and look for the plants? Do you have a local guide there? How do you do this in especially very remote places where you wouldn't expect that there's a lot of like tourism or infrastructure for foreign people who come to visit? Yes, in those sorts of countries uh, which are a little bit wilder and countries that we don't know, um, we do have a guide. Um, I try to contact a local guide rather than set it up from this country um, and find the right sort of vehicle. It, drivers like to go from A to B, um, and uh, we don't want it. We do want to go from A to B, but we want to take all day about it, and we want to go to C, D, E, and F on the way. Um, um, or maybe off the way a bit, uh, and sometimes up some rather remote tracks. Uh, so uh, it's a matter of trying to find the right vehicle and the right sorts of drivers. Most, uh, many of the, of the countries that we've visited uh, more than once, we just go on our own. We rent, rent a suitable vehicle from the airport and just go. So uh, in Morocco, um, Spain, Greece, um, most, of the, most of the Mediterranean countries, uh, Turkey, Uh, we just rent a car at the airport and go where we want to go. Where do we find the, uh, the information? Uh, well, we keep an eye on the literature. Um, I know the literature pretty well about fritillaries. Um, there's lots of floras um, available. This is my copy of the Flora of Turkey, <laughs> published in the 1970s. Uh, you can see it's well traveled we and well thumbed. <laughs> Um, in, in, in finding places. <laughs> This is a less well, well thumbed one, the flora of Iranica, flora Iranica, mm -hmm. uh, which has, um, it's just the, uh, some of the Liliaceae uh, in, in that section, but it has a lot of descriptions of where things are, which enables us to, uh, to, to, to refine these. And some of these records are hundreds of years old, but those plants are still there, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and good to know, you know, as long as the, the, the place hasn't been dammed and flooded or the road built or buildings have been built over it or it's been plowed up, which is the usual thing that happens. Um, so, you know, if you can find wild habitat, you often find, refine these things after even 100 years. What's the most astonishing finding that well, you have <laughs> made when you traveled to see the plants? I, I think that, that that's it. That final final point is that, is that you know things that have been there that, that were recorded uh, by the original describers uh, of these uh, of these plants are sometimes still there, and it's really worth going you know looking up the old literature and seeing if you can find the place. Now sometimes that, because it was before GPS, um, sometimes they're only described as um, the, in the surroundings of a particular village, and of course the village has changed name. Uh, so you've got to go through a lot of history and try to find the, you know, how that, what that name might have been changed to. Sometimes um, the village, um, of course, is written in, in Greek or in Cyrillic or, or something like that. And of course, it gets transliterated into English uh, or into Latin. Um, and you've got to try and work out what they actually meant by some of these vowel sounds or particularly the consonant sounds with transliterated into, into Roman script uh, in a different way depending on who does it. So, so that's a lot of fun. And that's sort of, you know, desk work uh, uh, when the winters are so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> It's a whole research project to go on a holiday for you. Oh, sure. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I will uh, spend hours at my computer looking up things on uh, Google Earth, um, Google Maps, um, using the maps that I have here. Um, looking at the old literature, as I say, looking at old books. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's surprising what you can sort of deduce, even just by looking at Google Earth. Google Earth is really good because it does show, you know, sections of forest, it shows fields, it shows trees, it shows the roads that you can use um, and, and, and translate, translates those into GPS, which, which then enables you to, to, to use the GPS to find your, find your way around. Well, to, to, Point to where you've got to go. Not necessarily, doesn't necessarily show you the road, but it shows you shows you the, the way to get there. 
So I was, um, I was wondering if there are uh, certain things that you would recommend people to be aware of before they travel and go out into nature, into, into the wild to search for plants. Yeah, I mean, you have to be very aware of, of local advice. Um, we have a, a very good website run by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office um, uh, here in the UK, uh, and we always check that before we go anywhere uh, to, to see what warnings that they put in place. Um, a lot of these places um, have, if you like, time windows when you can go in between uh, problems. I mean, for example, um, it was easy to travel to Syria uh, in the 90s, and uh, we went twice in the 1990s to visit Syria. There's no way I'm going anywhere near Syria at the moment. Um, we went to Lebanon in the in the 1990s, and that's that. That was uh, just after the uh, end of the um, civil war there, um, and and it was far from settled. There were parts that were protected by um, I think Israeli soldiers or something. I don't know. You couldn't go into South Lebanon anyway, um, but there were checks on the border. Um, we did have a few problems there. Um, that's that you know. Uh, but we just have to uh, obey, particularly road checks. You've got to be very careful, you know, to obey what the road checks are telling you. Um, if you if you do venture near a military uh, area, or um, there are always road checks, and you do do have to pay significant attention to them. The, uh, if you're implying, obviously, the, the safety, the real safety is to uh, to use a guide, a local guide, um, who can uh, can talk to these people. Um, it helps to have a bit of a language. I mean, we, we do have, a, you know, a, a few languages um, um, and, um, and a few names of flowers helps because you can often talk to the shepherds and they'll know exactly where the flowers are because they see them every day. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it, you, you do need to be aware of, uh, of, of the local uh, politics in particular um, and, um, you know, if, if in doubt, always have a guide. Yeah. Is there a travel, travel that you have made that you would say has been most remarkable for you? It seems like all your, what you, all you share is uh, it's very extraordinary. But is there something where you think that that really marked you in a way? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have been interested to see uh, as many frittle areas as possible uh, in as many countries as possible um, over the years. So um, when you start out, you go to countries where there's a lot of different frittle areas in, in, uh, in, in a small space, in a, uh, and uh, you go to all of those, but that leaves you the ones that are um, out on their own somewhere, like some of the ones I, I, I described earlier. So we, we've now tended to go a little bit further afield to see uh, fewer species, but those that you can't see um, because they're not mixed in with others. Probably the the, the, the center of, 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 of fritillaries in, in terms of numbers of species in a small area, probably situated in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and you can go into Greece and see a lot of species in uh, even in the space of a single day. Um, you can go into uh, Western Turkey and see a lot of species within a single day. Um, and you can go into Eastern Turkey and see a lot of different species um, in, in, a, in a single day, together with lots of other wonderful plants. Um, Iran is, is similar. So, you know, uh, Iran at the moment is a little bit difficult for, for people from the UK. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to another window opening up, which allows us to go there. You know, hopefully we can get there again one day. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, if, if I wanted to see a lot of fritillaries in the space of one day, I'd go to one of my fritillary hotspots, if you like. Mm. Um, and um, being totally, not totally fritillary focused, um, we actually rate some of these mountains by the numbers of species on them. So okay. um, we, we have uh, three frit mountains, for example. We have five frit mountains. We even have an eight frit mountain. How long do they flower there? We have the we have this big uh, the king's uh, meadow here in uh, in Uppsala where they flower about maybe two weeks. Uh, how long do these in the alpine areas flower? Um, mainly, it obviously depends on the weather because you you're waiting for the snow to melt. 
Um, and if they have, if there's a very cold winter, they will flower later because there's a lot more snow. Uh, in a very dry winter, um, they will flower earlier. But the, the peak time uh, is the second half of May for uh, for most of Eastern Turkey. Um, yeah, I would think just about every time we've been in Eastern Turkey, for looking for fritillaries anyway, um, it's uh, it's in the last two weeks of May. Mm. So when I see how they grow there out in the nature, they need the rocky, or they, they are thriving on a rocky um, terrain. When you culture them in your own garden, have you been putting in place a rock garden? For me, I am, I have been to Wales and I, well, there is rocks as well, but it's also very green and very lush and it's milder, as you also said. So how did you have to arrange your garden to make them grow there? We, we don't grow many species outside here in Wales. Most of them are grown in pots. Um, and the reason for that is the climate. So, um, yeah, we have created some places. We have, uh, we have a, 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 a moist meadow. Um, and Fritillaria meliagris grows extremely well in our moist meadow. Um, we set that up by uh, just um, mowing the grass, uh, taking all the mowings away. Uh, over a period of three or four years. <clears throat> we then introduced um, yellow rattle, which is a, is parasitic on grass. It's an annual with little yellow flowers, um, and it, and it uh, quiesces the grass. We then sowed um, uh, a lot of fritillary meliagra seed uh, in pots. We grew it on in pots, uh, in, in, in pots for two years. We planted out the two-year seedlings. They were about the size of my little fingernail. Uh, when we planted them out, and that was, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, there are now thousands. Um, <laughs> and um, they are, you know, there are more uh, fritillary leaves than there are grass uh, in, in, in that meadow now. Mm. Um, so, so it is possible to establish a fritillary meliagris meadow, even here in the west of Wales, where it doesn't grow naturally. Mm. Um, we have an, a few other species outside. Um, we have Fritillaria pontica growing outside. There's a plant from the north of Greece and the north of Turkey. Um, it grows in oak woodland and uh, so deciduous woodland. We've got plenty of deciduous woodland here um, and we plant it amongst the roots of the trees. The trees then of course are um, bare when it's coming up into flower so there's plenty of moisture in the ground. Uh, but once the leaf canopy comes on, it's uh, pulling the moisture out of the ground. Oak trees dry the ground out quite a lot. Uh, so that, if you like, provides that's the summer habitat that, that they require. Uh, Fritillaria pyrenaica will also grow outside here under similar conditions. Um, in uh, ooh, 2000, early 2000s, we described a new species of fritillary, fritillary from Syria. Uh, and it also occurs in uh, just in South, uh, a few places in South Turkey, um, called Fritillaria frankiorum. We named it after two of our friends, um, and that grows outside here. Now this is this is a, a, a weed of agriculture, and it be, had become established in uh, fields that have been ploughed, and it's a species that uh, vegetates very easily, so it produces huge numbers of small bulbs. So the bulbs just break up into thousands of little bits um, or hundreds of little bits um, every year. So uh, when, it, when the ground is disturbed, of course, they get spread around all over the place. It very rarely seems to set seed. Um, and um, that, uh, and it grows in, in basically fields that are wet in the, in the springtime because they're watered. And uh, in that region, they're growing tobacco in the fields uh, and it's in the tobacco fields. And its existence in the wild is absolutely dependent on the agricultural practice being kept the same. Uh, natural selection has, uh, has allowed a species that vegetates very easily um, to, to become established. It really sets seeds. So um, you don't have new um, genes or, or you don't have new mixing of the genes. So it's all one, one clone. And, and I think very likely it is, it, it, it's probably one or very few clones are actually in the wild at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as I say, you don't see the seed because it probably gets cut down with the, with the vegetation mm -hmm. before it sets seed. 
And who knows what's going to happen to the agriculture uh, in the future? And of course, it's on the border between Syria and uh, and Turkey, which is a, uh, a a problem area at the moment politically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know what's going to happen. It it, it could have been uh, could have refugee camps on it for all I know. I just don't know. I've not mm -hmm. been there back back there. But um, but this species actually seems to grow outside here. Um, uh, in in our vegetable bed. <laughs> <laughs> are there any pests that are affecting fritillaria when you're growing them, for example, in your garden? Is there something to be aware of or to look out for that you would advise people to have an eye on? Yes, there's been an, uh, an introduced pest here. It's been around since the 1970s. It came into southeastern England called lily beetle. This is a red beetle. Um, that uh, feeds on uh, on liliaceae, and it, it comes in and it loves Fritillaria meleagris, and it loves um, Fritillaria pyrenaica, um, and it likes uh, lilies. Lily martigan, for example, is a is a real uh, host for it. Um, it's natural in the Mediterranean region, and when you look at fritillaries in the Mediterranean region, you'll often see lily beetles on them. Um, and it's been it was introduced into uh, into southeast of England oh, many many years ago, and it's spread across most of uh, England, and it has come into uh, eastern Wales, and we very occasionally see them here in Wales. Most years we'll see one or two, uh, but if we go east, say fifty miles to Cardiff, um, then uh, the lilies are completely devastated by it. Um, the larvae uh, also feed on the lilies, so you can uh, the lar larvae are sort of horrible things that cover themselves in excrement. So uh, the, you know the, the simplest way is to just to try and pick them off. Mm. Um, otherwise, um, no, apart from usual problems with uh, fungi, if you get the watering wrong, um, then uh, uh, you know there th there are fairly straightforward as long as you get the watering right. We have listeners from uh, around the globe. So if somebody wanted to start growing them, let's see in the in the northern hemisphere, maybe maybe we should stay here. Are there some fritillarias that you would think are so general that they will thrive everywhere? Or are there other recommendations where you would suggest there are some key um, conditions that you need to figure out to know what kind of uh, fritillaria you can grow? Okay. I mean, I would start with Fritillaria meleagris. It's a very beautiful species. It has brown forms and white forms and several intermediates. Um, it grows easily outside. Um, it seeds around easily. It's easy to raise some seed. It's easy to get hold of seed. The other one that's probably easy to get rid of and grows particularly well in Sweden is Fritillaria kamchatsensis, uh, named after Kamchatka, uh, the, uh, the, the um, peninsula uh, which is part of eastern Russia, uh, down uh, north of Japan. Um, this is the species which occurs in Canada all the way through Alaska, uh, all of the uh, Aleutian Islands, um, eastern Russia, eastern China, and uh, northern Japan. So it has it's very, very widespread. And it grows in peachy soil um, in um, well, more or less floodplains, like the sort of place where Fritillaria meleagris grows. Uh, but much, much colder winter. And that's an easy species outside for you. Uh, it's easy outside in the north of the UK here. Um, it's, we don't find it that easy here. We don't get it to flower very well, but uh, it, it, it grown in, in acid soil, it's, it, it, it's a bit better. Uh, so Fritillaria campsite census, and that's readily available in the trade. Um, other species readily available in the trade, of course, the crown imperials, Fritillaria imperialis. Uh, that's the tall species. It's a meter tall, uh, striking orange flowers, and there's a yellow flowered form. That's in the trade, um, and uh, that needs uh, a summer dry habitat, um, but, but um, it, it would grow in a herbaceous border, for example. It just needs to be a bit drier in the summer, but herbaceous borders, because they have so much herbaceous stuff in there tends to be fairly dry uh, in the summer anyway. So, uh, so that's a fairly easy one. Um, if you want to, uh, and that's easy, easy, easily available. Um, and there are a few other species that are often available in the trade, Fritillaria persica, uh, Fritillaria acmopetala, uh, Fritillaria pontica, uh, are available in the trade because 
they grow well in the bulb fields, particularly in, in Holland, for example. Um, and so they can be propagated and distributed. Uh, if you need, if you want to get hold of the rarer species, uh, it's best to join one of the societies which distributes seed of the rarer species. Um, and they obtain seed from members uh, and then distribute it to, to, to other members who want it uh, by, by way of a catalogue uh, in the uh, late summer. Mm -hmm. Do you have any favourite Fritillaria species yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I guess I have lots of favourites, though. That's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, because it grows so easily, and it is, it is a striking species. Uh, Fritillaria meleagris has to be uh, high on the list of, of, of favourite species. Uh, Fritillaria aurea is is a, is a lovely golden species. Uh, it occurs in uh, right in the very middle of Turkey, in some very high mountains, uh, growing uh, in shady places where uh, snow is lying late. So it's on north facing slopes. <clears throat> so it flowers very late, and most of the time, the reason we've not found it is we've gone too early. That's that was that was a, a great joy that uh, one year we were um, on a mountain again. We took another tour, and suddenly some, somebody said, "Oh, there's Fritillaria aurea here," and we had no idea it was on the mountain that we were on. But uh, you know, it was, <laughs> um, and um, because it wasn't reported in the literature, so we mm -hmm. we found it in a in a new place, um, which is great. I mean, you know, that's uh, you know, it, it sort of all adds to the excitement. Um, uh, another one is. <laughs> Uh, I talk about political windows. We managed to get into the far southeast of Turkey. Um, we'd been there on two occasions. 2009, it was possible to go there. We had a, 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 an invitation from somebody who lived there. And uh, we went what, right the way down into the very far southeastern corner where Turkey, Iraq, and Iran join. And um, we were looking for a, a fritillary, which is, uh, we, had worked, or we had actually already found it in Iran, um, but uh, we, we knew that there was one site in Turkey for it, and we were determined to find it. So we got to where we thought it might be, and I got out of the car, and I walked down, and I looked underneath a bush, and there it was. So I let out a shout, it's here, it's here, it's here. <laughs> there was a police station, an army post, I don't know, 500 meters away. And there was a shout from up there, oi! <laughs> and then a lot of Turkish about basically, you can't go down there, mate. <laughs> we were taking photographs underneath the bush where they couldn't see us. Uh, uh, we dispatched my wife, who speaks a little bit of Turkish, up to the army post to say, well, what's your problem? <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, the, the, basically, they didn't want us to go there. They thought it was too dangerous. Uh, so... Um, we had to had had to leave, but we got the photographs. Yes, <laughs> that's really hunting for hunting yeah. for botanical memories. <laughs> that's true. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I I have some last questions here. Uh, the Fritillaria group. Um, what? Um, yeah, you have said you are distributing seeds. Uh, if uh, some people are interested in more rare species, what other activities do you have? And who are your members? Uh, is it international? Is it more UK based? Let us know a little bit about the group. Okay, the, the group was set up in 1997 by our two friends, Mr. and Mrs. Frank, after whom the Fritillaria Frankiorum was named. Um, uh, as a, a subgroup within the Alpine Garden Society. Uh, since then, we've become independent. We run a journal twice a year, uh, and I act as the editor. We have, when we're able, two meetings a year uh, where we have lectures. Um, so those are set up uh, in the UK, and we have, uh, well, it's, it's some of the best meetings we've ever had. We have a, we've had nearly 100 people Uh, listening to lectures by uh, experts on the genus, um, people who have lots of interesting tales to tell about their travels or their culture um, and their, their cultivation of, of, of fritillarias. Um, we run a seed distribution, and it's run by a, a, a small committee um, of which has a secretary and a treasurer, uh, and we have a website. So the, the website is www.fritillaria.com. .org.uk. 
We have a Facebook page. If you just put Fritil Aria Group in, you'll see the, see the Facebook page. That The members are uh, comprise a lot of the who's who of the, of, of, of the Fritil Aria genus. I mean, you know, we have eminent professors uh, who are interested in the genus. We have uh, people who have, uh, you know, spent years studying the genus um, who, who are members of that group and come along to the meetings and you get to talk to them. So, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, uh, it, it's a lot of fun, and we have a lot of fun setting it up, and um, we have a lot of fun uh, in, in running it. So, uh, you know, long may it continue. It mm-hmm. depends on depends on people being interested. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you have members outside of the UK, or are most of the members in the UK? Uh, the majority of the members are in the UK. We have members all over the world. We have members in New Zealand, Australia, America. We have a member in Japan. We have members in Russia. Uh, yeah, uh, lots of Europe. Ireland, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, all over, all over. So if people are interested, they are welcome to to get in touch. I will definitely put the, the links into the show notes of the podcast. I would love to hear personally from anybody who's interested, and I can uh, I can do that as well. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Lovely, yeah, excellent. Yeah. And I, I'm always so happy when I see that um, people connect around the globe for a specific interest, maybe cult- culture or arts or, or, or plants. <laughs> Uh, two last questions. Um, if you had to give uh, people a suggestion of one place in the world to visit for seeing lots of fritillies, what would that place be? I think I would go to uh, probably the southwest of Turkey, maybe to uh, somewhere like Marmaris, uh, where you can go out on the uh, peninsula, which uh, goes westwards from Marmaris, and see three different species. Um, or uh, Antalya, where you can go up into the Taurus Mountains and see three or four different species. Mm-hmm. Um, we love the uh, the <laughs> uh, another tour a trip that we've done is we've island hopped around uh, the east of Greece. Um, we've just flown into Athens Airport, gone across to the island of you know, uh, looked on the coast near the airport and then crossed on the ferry to Evia, uh, spent a day there, crossed back, uh, driven down to uh, the, uh, onto the Argolian Peninsula, uh, had, a, had a look at Epidavros, et cetera, gone across to two or three of the islands there, um, and all around on the Argolian Peninsula. There's a lot of species there um, if you know where to look, um, and sometimes even if you don't know where to look, you still find them. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, and I, so we had a, you know a great time, and uh, you can see a lot of species uh, just by island hopping around Greece in the in the space of less than a week. Mm-hmm. Lovely, yeah, definitely. When we can travel again, that may be a great place to see. Or oh, if absolutely. people are going there anyways to look out for these plants. Yes. <laughs> Um, and the last question, what kind of resources do would you recommend if people want to learn more about uh, Fritillaria? Okay. Um, I think uh, it's probably best to get one of the general books on bulbs. Uh, there are a couple that were written by Brian Matthew, uh, M-A-T-H-E-U, um, on dwarf bulbs, uh, that's what got us interested. Uh, they were written now in the 1970s, uh, but it's what got us interested in bulbs. Um, and it's got a lot of general tips on, uh, on on growing bulbs in pots, which is what we do most of. Um, and that's that 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 is probably you know the the, the best place to start as a general book uh, on fritillaria. Um, and um, I, I, I and uh, a, a few of my friends are uh, writing a monograph on the genus um, at the moment uh, that we hope to get published soon. Um, but pulling together several authors and 180 different species is not a small task. Um, <laughs> no, and getting, it yeah, not. <laughs> and, uh, so that's been going on for rather longer than I uh, than I. Uh, want to admit to <laughs> um, but um, it's uh, it, it, it is happening mm. and lovely to if you can sum up all your knowledge all your travels all that you have seen and discovered into into a book well it, exactly yes I mean it's it, it sort of you know it would be nice to leave a legacy behind put it that way mm. Mm. 
Is there anything else that I haven't asked that you would like to share? Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it's real fun growing bulbs. Uh, we spend, uh, you know, every day we go out and have a look in the greenhouse and see what's happening. Um, we've always got plenty to do out there. It's a thing that keeps these uh, idle hands that are used to researching things, um, that keep these idle hands busy um, and this, this idle brain busy as well. Uh, we have, I have my research collection out there, um, which uh, a allows me to continue doing what I, what I basically have been doing all my life, uh, and that's research things um, which interest me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you know, it's a huge amount of interest. Uh, it's uh, it's a lot of fun, um, and it keeps us retired folk busy. <laughs> I hope that when when my generation retires, we will be the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so too. <laughs> We will see. I hope I hope that my podcast helps for opening some eyes and well, for some people you. maybe to discovering a new passion. Yeah, thank okay. you very well, much well, for you. this interview, for sharing all your lovely insights, your travel, your pictures. You have to really put some time down to prepare for this. So I thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking with you. So uh, you know, thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you have enjoyed this interview. It has definitely made me want to travel and to see Fritillaria out in the wild and in its natural habitats. Um, if you haven't done it yet, have a look on our blog post associated to this podcast uh, linked in the show notes where you will find Bob's videos and especially also the presentation he has made on his travel to Anatolia. Maybe that can be a small compensation for us not being able to travel today and you can still find that you are going to see a different place. I invite you to join me here next week again when we are going to meet Lawrence Hill who has mounted a project and a web page that's called Fritillaria Iconis and he has been dedicating a large part of his life to botanical photography where he has immortalized many different Fritillaria species that are used in research publications and that he has also used himself in arts projects for exhibits. With that I wish you a lovely week and nice time in your gardens or out in nature and I hope you will be back here next week. <music>